What I'm interested in is sort of how the brain represents the world. Okay, so I do this. Everybody knows what these are, they're glasses. Presumably, unless you have brain damage, you know that these are a pair of glasses. So the question that I'm, gonna, I'm interested in, some of the techniques and approaches I'll take you through is, how do we get inside the brain and figure out how the brain does this computation to figure out that these are glasses, right? Um, presumably, there's some signal within your brain some firing of neurons or groups of neurons that allows each of you to make that conclusion that these are glasses, right? The psychological output is constant. We all perceive a pair of glasses. But the real question we're gonna try and get at is how does the brain actually figure that out at the cellular level, okay? So how does one go about just generally figuring out how the brain works and processes information? And it, really falls into two different camps, right? You can watch what the brain is doing, right? So uh, you're probably familiar with things like, um, like fMRI, so this is an image looking at activity in very broad regions of the human brain. Maybe while you're showing the patient some glasses. I, you know, that's not what's happening here, but one could imagine that if we wanted to figure out how the brain represents a pair of glasses, we would do that. We'd show them a pair of glasses, we'd show them something else, and look for areas that become active specifically when you see a, a particular object. Uh, this is activity at a, at a kind of a crude level where we can see broad brain areas. If you actually put wires into animals and in some human patients uh, awaiting surgery, you can get very precise activity responses from individual neurons, right? So we can go in and watch the brain while we show animals things, give them different sensory stimuli, and we can see the brain functioning in the firing, the electrical activity of individual um, neurons. So that's sort of one half of the way people try to figure out how the brain is processing information, and the other half is doing something to the brain. So as you're probably aware, there are a lot of different kinds of lesions to the brain. If you've ever read The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, right? We know actually a lot about how the brain is functionally parceled from human patients and animal models where parts of the brain are damaged, okay? And you can actually find lesions where you wouldn't be able to recognize glasses, but you might be able to recognize faces or animate objects. So there, there are very strange sorts of parceling of function like that. And we can also look pharmacologically where we manipulate the brain, or we can do genetic manipulations and look at how that affects the processing of the brain. So in that half, we're doing something to the brain and seeing that it has a difference in the animal's ability to perceive or its behavioral output. And what my lab does is really kind of try and break down or combine these two different approaches, right? One is just watching activity and we can see some really exquisite patterns of activity that are very tantalizing in, in suggesting how the brain might process information. And when we do our lesions, those are usually very gross. We don't get at that um, elegant dynamics of neural activity. And so what I want to show you is, is some approaches where we think we can do that, at least at a crude level, in experimental animals. So what's one of my favorite examples of the watching side of the brain in terms of how the brain might be processing information? So this was from a 2005 study in patients awaiting surgery for epilepsy. So they had electrodes in their brain. And you could actually record the activity of individual neurons of humans while you showed them hundreds and hundreds of pictures, okay? And in this particular study, they found um, neurons that seemed to respond specifically to one individual, this actress Halle Berry. So you could show them Halle Berry, you could show them other female actresses, famous politicians. Um, what was interesting is that this neuron actually responded to the letter string Halle Berry. So if you look at a neuron like this, this is probably you know, one of the most exquisite examples of neurons firing with great specificity to sensory cues. Um, you think, this neuron's got to somehow be involved in, uh, in recognizing who this actress is, okay? And so the thought experiment, what we're trying to develop, is to ask the question, 
if we could take that neuron, or that it's a, probably a group of neurons, and we could artificially activate it, what would, what would happen? What would the patient report? Would you see an image of Halle Berry floating in front of you? Would you have a recollection? Would you have a feeling? Could we actually show that these neurons that fire in response to a very specific stimulus actually have a function in the animal? So if you like Star Trek, that's, it's already been done, right? Everything has already been done first in Star Trek, all scientific advances. So the idea is if we could go in and stimulate the brain in the appropriate pattern of cells, could we get an actual perception or a memory? Okay, so that's what we're going toward. Um, and so how do we do that? Well, the approach that we're taking is um, to use a genetic manipulation uh, in genetically modified mice. So mice are great, you can, you can put genes into them, you can manipulate their uh, uh, genome with, with great ease. And one of the genes we were interested in is, is actually this group of genes that have been known for about 30 years. And neuroscientists have used their expression as a, a surrogate marker for neural activity. Okay, so these are called immediate early genes, CFOS, ZIF, ARC, there's a whole group of them. And if you're a rodent neuroscientist, you're going to be familiar with something like CFOS, right? So this is a gene that seems to get turned on when a neuron is highly active. And what's nice about them, their induction is rapid. Within minutes of the neuron being active, they'll turn on. They turn over rapidly so that you kind of can get a snapshot of how the brain was active in a time window of hours, a few hours. And as I said, I think there was, like, last time I looked, there were maybe 9,000 papers in Medline where they've been used to track activity, and they're pretty consistent with what we know about what we would expect from activity um, from other, uh, other uh, ways of studying uh, neural activity in the brain. Okay, so we, we have a genetic way of actually taking neural activity and leading it to produce an, another uh, a genetic change just in cells that are active. But of course, cells are active all the time. And for instance, if we're going to show them Halle Berry or the, my pair of glasses, we want to limit that time when we're taking a snapshot of your active neurons. And we want to only manipulate the neurons that are active just in that period of time when I'm giving you a particular stimulus. So the way to introduce that kind of temporal control is to use uh, a, a, a second genetic trick which is to take something called the tetracycline transactivator. So this is just a transcription factor that's responsive to the antibiotic doxycycline and will activate another target promoter. And then any gene you're interested in, you hook up to that. So this is a binary system, right? As long as this yellow compound doxycycline is present, this promoter will drive TTA. So it'll be going up and down, up and down in neurons as they're active but it won't have any effect on the second gene, the gene that we're going to be interested in. Um, on the other hand, when we take away doxycycline, so we, now we've opened up a window where we not only, if the neuron's active, we get TTA, it in turn will activate the green gene, and we'll get expression just in those cells that were active in this time window. And then we can put them back on doxycycline, and depending on how long the green protein lasts, we'll have a snapshot of the active ensemble of neurons, and those neurons will be genetically modified, right? This is any gene, literally any genetically encoded uh, molecule we want to put in uh, to those neurons we can, we can put in. Okay, so as you might imagine, your brain is kind of active all the time at some level. Neurons are never completely silent, and a lot of people ask me, so what kind of activity is FOSS reporting and it's a little hard to say precisely, but it essentially, this is probably the best example uh, from a 2009 paper from Thomas Oetner's lab, um, trying to look at the parameters that will induce FOSS. And essentially what they did is they infected cells with a step channel opsin, so they could depolarize the cell, get a certain number of action potentials at a certain frequency, and then ask whether that turned on FOSS or not. And essentially what they found was that if you deliver 30 action potentials or more at 5 hertz or above, I believe the number I come away with is like 90% of cells will induce FOSS. So it's a, it's a burst of activity. So most cells are probably not giving this kind of burst of activity, right? We're not detecting single action potentials. All right, 
So I'm going to take you through three questions. And the last question is going to be, can we do that Halle Berry experiment? Can we put a thought or perception into the animal's head? But first, I'll take you through a couple of other things, uh, some, some older things that uh, I think outline some of the ways we can use uh, this particular approach uh, to try and dissect uh, uh, circuits in the brain and encoding in the brain. So a first simple question is, do the same neurons that are activated during learning become reactivated during recall? So if I show you a pair of glasses and I hide them and I show them to you again, right, your perception is the same. Presumably there's some signal, some pattern of neurons that's going to get reactivated. Um, can we see that? How many neurons get reactivated? Is, is it a lot? Is it a little? Um, and we can use this by putting tags into the neurons at two different time points, one tag using uh, our genetic trick. Oops. So the behavior for all of the experiments I'm going to show you is fear conditioning. So this is a simple Pavlovian task where you put animals, again, these are going to be mice, into a conditioning chamber. You let them explore the box for a little while. You will sometimes play a tone or give some sort of simple signal and then give them a, a, a mild foot shock, okay? And you can basically train an animal in five minutes, and this will produce a fear memory uh, that will essentially last the rest of their life. Uh, so, and, and when they get this kind of training, they're actually learning two things, right? So, they're going to be afraid of that same box, right? If you put them in a box that has all the same cues, they're going to show uh, a fear response. This is called a context uh, fear conditioning. Uh, and this is a form of memory that is explicit, meaning it requires the hippocampus. Now, the hippocampus is a part of the brain that's important for what we think of as, in human, sort of conscious memory, right? Memory for people, places, specific events or episodes. And so you can also put them in a different box, change things around, fool them so they're not afraid, and they'll be afraid of the, the sound that you played that was paired with the shock. And that's a little bit anatomically different. That's a cued um, fear conditioning. That does not require the hippocampus. In humans, that would be something that was maybe something you're not conscious of. You know, a typical example is like a motor learning task is an implicit task where you're, you're not actually conscious of the precise movements of your tennis stroke, but you do learn to get better. Okay, so this is the task we're, we're using. And both of these tasks, well, this one requires the hippocampus and this one doesn't, they both seem to require the amygdala, all right? So that's been a well-studied area for fear responses. And now we're just gonna ask the question, when we train them and then when we test their memory recall, are we activating some of the same amygdala neurons, the precise neurons, uh, in that case. And so the way we do this, now we've got this system where we can tag a group of cells with our fancy genetics. In this case, we're using a LAC-Z marker. So it just doesn't matter what it is. It's gonna be just a red indicator. And so we can take animals off of doxycycline. We have this time window where the FOSS active neurons will get labeled, will express our gene, and now we can put them back on doxycycline so we don't label them anymore with the red and we have a record of how the brain was active in this little slice of time as, as a color, basically, in the individual cells. And then we can train them in fear conditioning and we can give them a recall trial, put them back in the box, let them express their fear, and then if we wait about one hour, we can use one of the endogenous genes, remember these are very ac responsive to activity, as a marker for the second time point. And so we've now got red and green and we can compare what exactly is the pattern of cells when the animal learns and when he retrieves. We'd expect to see some coherence there, all right? And you can just see that. You just make sections and you look at the uh, expression of the two colors and there's one that expresses at both time points and there are some that express only at one or the other time point. So in this kind of experiment, um, we're gonna have a number of groups of animals here. Some just sit in their home cage doing nothing. So they get home cage for the first label, home cage for the second label. Uh, in one group, the no shock NS group, they get brought into the box, but they don't get shocked. And then they get brought back into the box. Okay, so they have two exposures to the box, but they don't have the fear learning associated with it. 
And then the other two groups, th these are both getting the fear conditioning, so the shock in the box. And then three days later, we either give one a retrieval trial and one doesn't get a retrieval trial. Okay. So the first thing that you can see here is that if you look, essentially the neurons that are responsive uh, in the basal lateral amygdala where we're looking are responsive to shock, right? So this FC plus FC NR group, those are guys getting shock. The NS group, the guys that just are brought into the box, don't seem to show us uh, any different level of expression from animals that just sit in their home cage. So the shock in this case is the US, the unconditioned stimulus, and you'll see, I may start saying things about CS and US um, in a bit. So anyway, we have a group of shock responsive neurons there. Now, what is, that's not particularly interesting. The real question is, when we start to look at neurons that are double labeled, so neurons that are activated both with the learning when they're getting the shock and during the retrieval when they're recalling the, the fearful experience. And now what you see is, so here's the fear condition group, no retrieval, here's the no shock group. The only guy that um, has a significant degree of reactivation where you get the double labeling is in the fear condition group where they got the retrieval. Okay. So what that suggests is a, is a situation as follows. This is not all that surprising, but you'll remember I said, so during the learning, if we give animals shock, we, st we express this marker in, in some increased group of neurons. So we're labeling a group of uh, US neurons. The CS, in this case, is the box, right? So actually, you remember, if we just put them in the box, we don't get a lot of increased activity in the amygdala. But presumably, there are some places where the US neurons, the neurons activated by the US, also see, receive some weaker input from the, the CS. And essentially, now, after the fear conditioning, after they receive these two things together, you find that the CS alone, just the box, that's what a recall trial is, are able to activate uh, an increased number of these neurons that were originally activated only by the US. And presumably that's due to some sort of plasticity or strengthening of connections there. And that's, that would be an interpretation that's consistent with what um, sort of current models are for how um, learning works. Okay. so. We've just used this approach so far as a, a fancy way of looking at activity at two different time points. But, I mean, we're seeing something that's uh, somewhat consistent with what we would expect for um, activity that's encoding um, specific information. All right, so, yes. First question, the answer seems to be yes, and people have seen this in, in uh, many other areas as well. So the next question, the next thing we can use this uh, approach for is to really look at whether there are cellular and molecular changes that are specific to activated circuits. So one of the problems we have with sort of the molecular and biochemical characterization of learning and memory is if an animal, you know, we can train an animal and then if we wanted to look for molecular changes or biochemical changes, what cells do we pick out? How do we pick the cells that are participating in the learning versus the presumably 90% that are not? And um, of course, we can put any gene into these cells, so we can put biochemical tags in. We can actually use them to track um, biochemical mechanisms um, specifically in activated groups of neurons. So one set of experiments we did several years ago was looking at um, a possible mechanism for uh, synaptic plasticity. So the standard view of how learning and memory mu must work it involves some form of activity-dependent change in synaptic strength, so LTP. And there's CAMP kinase, which Holly mentioned. And I'm not going to go through the molecular details of all of this. There's the work of a lot of people. Uh, this particular model, mostly uh, from Robert Malinow, who's over at UCSD now. The general idea is that as a synapse gets used, one way of maintaining plasticity is to insert new receptors into the synapse that was active. Okay. So that was an existing model, and, and Malinow had shown that this kind of uh, receptor trafficking and work at a short time scale with pre-existing receptors. All right. 
And so that's kind of where we came into this question. And one of the things we wanted to ask was to look at this um, sort of paradox in, in memory research. So um, a long-standing dogma is that long-term memories require protein synthesis, whereas short-term memories do not, right? So by short-term and long-term, I mean one hour versus 24 hours or so. So how can this happen, right? What I just showed you is a mechanism to change individual synapses. There are thousands of synapses on a given cell. How does the nucleus communicate with or affect or stabilize just the synapses that were activated for a particular uh, uh, memory, for instance, as opposed to the 9,990 other synapses, okay? Um, and one idea was that activated synapses, synapses that are participating in undergoing plasticity and maybe participating in the storage of information, produce some molecular tag that allows them to capture new genes coming out of the nucleus only at those synapses, okay? So with all that set up, we thought, well, one good thing that you could capture would be newly synthesized glutamate receptors because you have this model of how uh, those receptors may uh, produce uh, initial increases in plasticity, and if you just maintain more of them, grab more of them, um, you could maintain that increase in synaptic strength over longer periods of time. All right, so that's the question. How do we go about this? So all we do is we swap out the gene here that we're going to regulate, and in this case, we're gonna have a GFP tag to GluR1. So actually, this is the same arrangement as was done in some of the initial experiments from, from Malinau. And now we're going to train animals off doxycycline. We're gonna get inactive cells only expression of this glutamate receptor. It's going to go up. We're gonna put them on doxycycline. We're gonna close that window. So now we're, we know we're looking at a pulse of receptor that was initiated at the time of learning and in the specific cells that were at least active enough for for FOSS to be turned on, all right? And then we're gonna wait 24 hours. That's gonna get distributed out into the um, dendritic arbor, and we're gonna see where, where does this go, all right? So this experiment is essentially take the animals off doxycycline. You'll see this is four days. It takes about three days to, two to three days for the doxycycline to clear the system and another day for it to clear enough to get good um, activity pace. Uh, induction. And we're going to look at fear conditioned animals and context exposed animals. And we also have, I won't show you, some unpaired controls. So there's a whole bunch of controls. But the basic question is if I fear condition animals, will I change the distribution of receptors versus if they're not learning that fear association with the box? Um, so we fear condition them. We wait 24 hours, we sack them, and we look at where the receptor's gone. Now, what I should say about this, if you remember that first example, the neurons were activated by shock, the US. In the hippocampus, I should say, now we're looking in the hippocampus, um, those neurons seem to be activated just by the CS, by exploring the box. They're not sensitive to the shock. So if you just look at the quantity of induced receptor, the context only, the box only, and the fear conditioning produce about the same total quantity of receptor. And then you can also see that if you look at individual cells. So this is just counting the percentage of neurons in CA1 that get turn on this tagged glutamate receptor, this GFP tagged glutamate receptor. And you know, what you can see is that by about two hours you can, after fear conditioning, um, you can start to see it in about 20% of cells. If the animals are just left in their home cage off doxycycline, you only get about 7% of cells labeled. But what's important is whether we shock them or not, the number of cells labeled is about the same, okay? So these are not neurons that are at least FOSS responding to the shock. And so you can see that after about six hours, you get this green signal um, spreading out all over the dendritic arbor. And that is reporting glutamate receptors. 
And we can just label the entire dendritic arbor with a, a lipophilic dye here. So this actually fills the entire, outlines the entire dendrite. And what you can see is these little spine protrusions on the dendrites. Those are called dendritic spines. They're the site of excitatory uh, synapse formation. And you can see these little dots of green. And you can see that there are some of these spines that have a little dot of green and some that don't. And so we just go in and basically count those. And you, you can divide these up into different morphologies. We don't know a lot about the functional difference of these morphologies, but they're defined as follows. Thin, they have this long neck, but a little tiny tip. Um, there are some that are called stubby that don't seem to have a, a neck at all. And then there are these large head, small neck, uh, mushroom spines. And it's generally thought that these are the more mature uh, synapses and that these uh, may be significantly more dynamic. And again, you can see the green at the tip where we know synaptic contacts are. All right. So if we first just look at, um, all right, so I'm just showing you fear conditioned and context only, right? There's no difference. Uh, in the number of total spines of a particular type, the percentage of total spines of a particular type that have a cluster of glutamate receptors above our detection threshold. Now, one thing you will notice, you could see it from that picture, there were little puncta. It's not evenly distributed, right? One might imagine that the receptor is being expressed, proteins are turning over, they're getting replaced, and you would get a, a nice even distribution. Only about 50% of spines showed a detectable uh, level of glutamate receptors, but there was no effect of the learning. On the other hand, if you segregate out the mushroom spines, what you find is that in the fear-conditioned animals, you see about a 25% increase in the number of spines that have actually captured uh, a group of, uh, uh, a cluster of receptors. And you can do unpaired controls with this and you don't see that increase there. All right, so, so what does that say? As essentially, what we have here now is we, we've looked at a biochemical trafficking uh, experiment just in the population of neurons that were active, and we can see learning-specific differences in the trafficking of receptor to different uh, synaptic sites. And it's consistent with the idea that learning produces a synaptic tag. Now, why do I say that? Because what is fear conditioning doing? Right? At the time of learning, you're getting electrical activity in that cell. It's that FOS-based response to electrical activity that's actually turning on the gene. All right? It's also presumably producing synaptic changes that underlie the actual learning. Right? The animals learn this right away. Um, but yet there's clearly no receptor out there. So we've separated in time the expression of the protein and the capture of that protein by the synapse by at least two hours, right? You can see in that picture at two hours there wasn't a lot of receptor out there. But yet somehow two to 24 hours later, certain spines can pick up more receptor if you've had paired fear conditioning and just context exposure or unpaired shock didn't uh, seem to lead to that kind of an increase. All right. So that's one mechanism potentially uh, where we might uh, that might underlie some information encoding uh, this kind of selective trafficking of receptor to activated synapses. So, <clears throat> um, another thing that people think might underlie long-lasting forms of learning and memory would be structural changes, right? If I actually create a new connection between cells, uh, that may be more stable than just changes in uh, molecular concentration of receptor or phosphorylation states. And we can look at that as well. Now, people had seen, you know, structural changes with learning and various sensory uh, inputs uh, quite a lot, but it had not been looked at specifically in activated circuits, right? So that kind of, those kinds of structural changes might be homeostatic. If they're actually involved in learning, you would expect them to be limited to the group of cells that are active by the particular form of learning. So it's essentially the same kind of setup and from, it uh, wasn't the same data, it was a set of, different set of experiments, but we can see a cell that, a dendrite that wasn't active, so it doesn't have any green and another one that is green and we can 
essentially compare structural changes in the active versus inactive circuit. And what you see is that rather than increasing with fear conditioning, if we just look globally at all different types of spines, we see a decrease, uh, right? So now this is active versus inactive. This would be just a classic experiment where we didn't have that FOSS labeling. On the other hand, if we now break it up into, so CTX is just exposed to the box but not shocked. If we break it up into inactive, so red cells were not active, they didn't um, uh, have the GFP signal uh, versus active, um, context didn't really have much of an effect, just exposure, but this drop in uh, the fear conditioning group seemed to be completely restricted to the GFP tag group. So we're seeing this reduction in spine number that's specific only to the activated group of neurons. And in fact, we can see that for that group of mushroom spines, that more mature group of spines uh, in the fear condition group, the inactive versus the active, we see a statistically significant difference there that accounts for most of this change globally. So what have I just shown you? I've shown you two things. How can this store memory? Why would we take away spines? Well, I've just shown you two possible mechanisms for changing connectivity. And neither one of them may be important for encoding information. We haven't demonstrated that. We've just observed them. But if you think about what must be important in storing information is you need to have mechanisms for both increasing connectivity and decreasing connectivity to maintain some level of homeostasis, okay? And so what we have here is I just showed you two potential mechanisms, one where you trap more receptors, excitatory receptors that should strengthen synapses, and one where you lose uh, uh, specific spines which should reduce, um, eliminate um, synaptic connections. And one can imagine how both of these mechanisms happening in activated neurons could remold the way that cell was responding to information, uh, input, and, and thereby store information. All right. So those are just examples of how we can use this kind of tagging to follow molecular changes and just specifically in activated groups of neurons how we can use that tagging as just a visual uh, marker to look for structural changes between uh, active versus inactive groups of neurons. But uh, I set it all up that we're going to stimulate the Halle Berry neurons, so now let's get on to, to that. All right. So the first set of experiments uh, I'm going to show you were done where we're going to put a gene in that allows us to depolarize cells. Uh, and this is a chemical genetic approach where we put in a receptor, it's called the DREAD approach, so designer receptor exclusively activated by designer drug. So essentially what this is is a human muscarinic receptor that's been mutated to no longer respond to acetylcholine, but to respond to this uh, chemical clozapine and oxide that you can buy from Sigma and crosses the blood-brain barrier fairly rapidly. And in a cell that expresses this receptor, so this is not, it's not an ion channel, it's not opening up uh, directly uh, ion channels, but what this, the effect of activating this GQ-coupled receptor is to get you about a five to 10 millipole uh, membrane potential depolarization. So this is from, uh, paper from our collaborator where you know, if you express this in a cell and you give CNO, you'll depolarize the cell and you'll start to get um, spontaneous increases in spiking. All right. So we made a mouse that expresses this in the FOSS driven way. And so one point I'll make is that the expression is all over the neocortex in the hippocampus, this is the hippocampus, but if you can see it up close here, you can see it's not in every cell, it's maybe in 10, 15 percent of cells uh, based on the, the um, FOSS-based um, promoter activity. All right, so in the, this set of experiments and a, another set of experiments I'm gonna show you, there's going to be a lot of setups like this, all right? So what we're gonna do is expose them to box A and off doxycycline. And so we're gonna drive this receptor, presumably into the neurons that are active 
uh, while the animal's exploring box A. So if you think of that as the Halle Berry box, we're showing them the Halle Berry box, we're labeling the Halle Berry neurons. Okay. And then we're going to put them back on doxycycline, and we're going to fear condition them in a different place. They have to be somewhere when we're giving them the shock. And, and at the same time, we're going to inject the CNO. So we're going to depolarize these cells, the blue cells, the Halle Berry cell, box cells, and they're going to be more active. Now, of course, the animal's looking around box B. He's getting some activity due to box B, and he's getting shock-based activity. So the question is, how will this all be integrated? Okay, so there are a number of things you might imagine. What I set out to show you was that the mouse would now be afraid of box A, right? I turn on the Halle Berry box neurons and he's now afraid of that. We did not see that at all, right? So there was absolutely no effect. He, he could care less about the box that he wasn't shocked in. Even though we were turning on those neurons that were activated by the box while he was being shocked. This is not all that surprising. Um, well, what did it do about his ability to learn box B, the one he was actually in while he was getting shocked? Well, I mean, normal animals will learn about that quite nicely. So if we didn't activate the A box neurons with CNO during training, they freeze about 50%. This freezing, if I didn't say it, is a, an expression of fear that we use. So um, these guys are really afraid of the box. These guys could care less, actually. They're, that's one of the best effects I've ever seen on fear conditioning. That also is not all that surprising when you think about what we're doing. We're depolarizing neurons all over the neocortex. Uh, it, it, about 10 to 15, 20 percent of animals were excluded because they had seizures. We're really changing the activity of the brain around a lot. So that, that wouldn't be all that interesting either. What was really surprising was that if we actually took animals that were trained while that box A, Halle Berry box neuron was fired, okay, they, they didn't remember at all in box B, but if we now return those cells back on by giving them CNO, um, their freezing went up almost, you know, it went up substantially. It was, well, obviously this was statistically significant. This is not statistically significantly different. So, so what does that mean? What do we think is going on? And what we think is going on is that the animal is, it's essentially learning about exactly what it experienced. That I get a shock when internally in my brain the box A neurons are active. While I'm in box B, that's when I get a shock. Um, so that's quite striking that the animal seems to be able to integrate patterns of activity distributed out throughout the whole brain in such a sort of poorly controlled um, and widespread manner. So is that really the case? So I'll just give you a couple of slides to try and convince you that he's really learning about the pattern of cells, right? Maybe he's just learning every time there's a lot of activity in my brain when I'm in box B, I get shocked, but not the actual specific pattern. And so we can ask that question now, and th this is some of the kinds of tricks you can play with this approach, right? So we trained animals while firing these box A neurons and then what I showed you is that when we reactivate them in box B, he, they remember. And I want to convince you that he's really learned about that particular pattern and not just general activity. So I can put them back on doxycycline, and if I wait two weeks, this protein will turn over in the pattern of cells that he initially learned about. And I can just put the same receptor into a different pattern of cells for box C and ask, will activating any ensemble of neurons give me that increased freezing? And the answer was no, right? So if I wipe that slate clean um, and label a different group of cells, I don't get that big increase in freezing when I give CNO. So it's not just generalized activity. Now the other th experiment that uh, uh, Alina Garner, who, who uh, was the graduate student who did this group of experiments, um, was as follows. So she reasoned that Basically, what if we just exposed him to box B? Now we're going to be labeling the same group of neurons he's going to use, presumably, for encoding this information. If we depolarize them, actually maybe we'll make the animal learn better or perform better. So the only difference between this experiment I'm going to show you and the first experiment is that instead of two 10-minute exposures to box A for the labeling here, 
he got two minute, 10 minute exposures to box B. Everything else is the same, the shocking and everything else. And you'll remember when we labeled the box A neurons, he was freezing way about down here. And now he's freezing just fine. Right? And so this is not statistically different. And also he's not responsive if we give him CNO or not. It's, it's irrelevant. So I mean, hopefully that set of experiments can convince you of that what I'm going to say is going on is actually happening, which is that we're creating some sort of hybrid neural representation between what we're artificially activating in his brain with CNO, the old memory, uh, that we turn on with this artificial means, and whatever is centrally driven new memory, and that really what the animal learns is some hybrid representation of both so that you need to get both of these things activated to get recall. So you might ask, that's a crazy um, experiment that really must have no biological significance at all. And, you know, I, I don't know uh, whether it does or not, but I can tell you that your brain is doing something like this all the time, right? So my example is, if you walked into a calculus class and never had algebra, you wouldn't get anything out of that. You're always integrating new information with information that's stored internally. So one way I think of, that this, of this happening is as you walk into calculus class, you know it's going to be about math, you get certain cues, it brings up old information, new information is coming in, and you essentially integrate those two things. There, there has to be some way at which that that is working just based on you know, psychological evidence. And so here we've demonstrated with this highly artificial means that we can get something like an integration of internal activity with new ongoing sensory activity, all right? And so that just summarizes what I said. And essentially the point is we think this may be associated with forming schemas, integrating different things, uh, different relevant um, bits of information. But did we, we didn't do what we set out to do, did we create uh, an artificial representation. Did I do that thought experiment? And the answer is, well, we sort of created something artificial, but we're not quite sure what it is, all right? And, uh, you know, probably that's because we don't have very precise control with uh, this CNO effect in terms of how we fire cells, or at least that's what we, we thought. And so what we really had wanted to do all along and we're, we're doing in parallel was to get uh, a channel rhodopsin uh, mouse so that now we substitute the new gene, this time it's, it's a version of channel rhodopsin called CHEF. Um, I, the neuroscientists all know what channel rhodopsin is. It's a light responsive ion channel so essentially if you express this gene in a neuron and you shine a blue light on it, it will spike the cell. All right, and CHEF has some slightly different um, physiological properties that are a little better in terms of firing at high frequency. We just use it because it expresses quite well. So now we can put a gene in where we get much more precise millisecond control over the electrical activity of the group of cells we're gonna, going to label. And in this set of experiments I'm going to show you, I'm going to take you to a different area called the retrosplenial cortex. Um, that's this area up here. I've talked to you about the hippocampus. I've talked to you about the amygdala. Uh, the retrosplenial cortex is, receives a major output from the hippocampus. So it's an output cortical area of the hippocampus. Um, and this is the expression of channel rhodopsin in, in that area. Uh, this is individual neurons in CA1 expressing the channel rhodopsin. Uh, and this is activation of CFOS by light shined through the skull, right? So we don't even have to open up the skull. We just put an LED there, shine light through the skull, and you can see FOS-based activation. And in slices, you can see that um, you can spike these neurons with, with light. So now let's go back and do the Halle Berry experiment. I guess I've switched the boxes around. This one, it's B over here and not A. Um, but we're going to do the experiment that I guess one would have thought to do first, which is just fear condition them in box B, label those cells with the channel rhodopsin, put them in a different box that they're not afraid of, light up those cells and ask, 
are they afraid? Are they afraid? Okay. And the answer is yes. So remember, this is a measure of fear. If we look at wild types, transgenics that only got the box, no shock, we can shine light onto the channel rhodopsin labeled cells in the RSC. They don't show a significant increase in freezing. But if we take the transgenics that were fear conditioned, now we can shine light and the animals are afraid. Okay. So we'd sort of like to argue that we're doing something like putting the thought of box A or in inducing a recall event for box A or box B uh, in these mice. But again, you always have the question of, is it the specific pattern of cells, or is it just something about activating any neurons in that region? And so you want to show the specificity that you are really having an effect uh, uh, that's based on the specific pattern of cells activated by one stimulus and not the other. So in this case, we're going to do the experiment this way. We're going to just label the cells when the animal explores box A. So no shock. And we're going to label it in a different group of animals, exploration of box B. So now we've labeled two different ensembles, one for A, one for B. And we put them back on doxycycline so we don't label any more cells. And now we fear condition them both to A, right? So in this group, we've labeled the cells for the box that they, we've subsequently made them afraid of. In this group, we've labeled a group of neurons for a different box. And we can ask whether we see the kind of specificity we would expect. And so if you look at this now, if you shine the LED on the retrosplenial and tag in the group that we tag the A box, we get the freezing. In the group where we tag the B box, we didn't. So it's not just activating any ensemble of neurons. It really is specific to what um, uh, environmental stimulus activated those neurons. So we think this is reasonably close to the idea of putting a thought, a memory, stimulating a, a pattern of activity that's consistent with recruiting uh, a recall event. So now, how, how do we do that? How do we know really what a mouse is thinking? And we can't, right? So we can't ask the mouse, what did you perceive while we were stimulating your brain? And sort of the best we think we can do is ask, how similar is the activity of the rest of the brain in the mouse when he's naturally put in the box to recall the fearful event, right? Which we always call, by definition, memory, a memory trial, a recall trial. And when we do our very artificial stimulation, which also produces fear, but we're not quite sure exactly what the mouse is perceiving. If those two patterns are, the, are similar, then we would have some evidence that we're actually recapitulating an event that's processed in a similar way to the actual natural event. So to do that, we're using an approach called catfish. I mean, I won't go into the details of it, but it essentially allows us to tag the activity of two different populations of neurons at two different time points, OK? So we're going to do LED simulation of box A neurons, right? So that's going to produce a fear event. And it's going to tag, it's going to cause the activity of some pattern of neurons in the amygdala, which we know is important for the fear output. Not the area we're stimulating, some area way downstream in the brain that is um, associated with the fear response. And we can see how the brain gets activated with our artificial stimulation. And we can take the same animal and put him naturally in box A. He recalls it. He expresses his fear. And he also activates a pattern of neurons. And then we can just compare and ask how similar are, is the overlap between these groups of neurons, with the idea being if there's a uh, greater similarity that what we're doing has is natural. It's, it's sort of similar to what the natural processing of that information is. And so if you look at this whole graph, the black slides are the amount of double labeling, so labeled for our LED stimulation and the natural exploration of box A, which is a fearful box, versus LED stimulation and natural exploration of a separate box. Okay, and what you can see is that in these areas, B and CEA, so two areas of the amygdala known to output context conditioning, you see this increase in overlap in the LED box A groups of neurons. In some other areas of the amygdala, you don't see that. In the entorhinal, you see it. 
and in some other control areas you don't see uh, an increase. So this suggests, this shows essentially that the LED stimulation and the natural recall event are activating increasing uh, uh, the similar patterns of, of neurons at downstream regions. And you know, we think that is you know, one sort of bit of evidence to suggest that we're actually recapitulating something very similar to what um, uh, a natural recall event was. Um, so I showed you that we can use this uh, FOSS-based, activity-based tagging to introduce essentially any gene based on natural activity patterns that we can get a cortical representation in the RSC of context that occurs at the time of learning. And I've sort of hopefully shown you something close to that experiment I set out initially, which is if we stimulated a pattern of neurons that's naturally activated by a stimulus like my glasses or, or Halle Berry, that we can actually get the animal to process that in a similar way to the actual experience. And I, we think, you know, we're, our lab is doing a lot. And essentially, the only thing we do uses this approach. We think it's very useful in the sense that we can now link these two things, the elegant patterns of activity you see that are sensually evoked with genetic change, and we can put essentially any genetic modification into active groups of neurons. I've shown you how we can use that for activity modulation, for biochemical tagging. We could do this for, you know, biochemical tagging and, and looking for um, actual functional changes or proteomics. Uh, we can use, use it to look for structural changes within neurons. And essentially, we could start putting genetic modifications that affected function in there to see how, uh, how neurons are, uh, what, what molecular signaling pathways are important in neurons for learning. So let me thank all of the people who've done this. So I've shown you some old things. Leon Raymers uh, developed the TET tagging approach in that first set of experiments I showed you on just looking at overlap. Uh, Naoki Matsuo did the GFP uh, trafficking set of experiments. Uh, Jeff Sanders uh, did the spine counting and structural studies, which were very laborious and tedious. I don't know why he's smiling there, but <laughs> I promised we wouldn't do any more spine experiments. Uh, uh, Alina Garner was the uh, primary uh, graduate student who did the, the dread-based um, activity work. And Kiriana Kaunsage, who's here and still in the lab, uh, did the primary uh, person on the um, uh, channel rhodopsin. Uh, based activation in the uh, retrosplenial, and she had some help from Blythe Dillingham, who's here, and I don't have a picture of her yet, and some of our outside collaborators um, who helped us on various aspects of the project. And that's it. Thanks. <laughs>